Today's webinar is entitled Studio-Based Online Learning, Building Community and Engaging Design at a Distance. My name is Beth Mundell Garber. I am Director of Applied Learning and Faculty at the Boston Architectural College. I'm also a registered architect. Currently, I serve as Director at Large on the Board of Directors for ACSA. Thank you for joining us today. ACSA is an international nonprofit association of architecture schools preparing future architects, designers, and change agents. ACSA represents over 5,000 architecture faculty in the United States, Canada, and abroad, including international schools as well as two- and four-year programs. First, we would like to define some terms. Distance education is considered the overall inclusive term for institutionally-based education where there is separation between student and teacher, interactive telecommunications, and content that is shared between learners and instructors. By definition, distance education includes all of these components. Online learning and online education are terms frequently used in higher education to refer to distance education. The approach to this webinar rests on several key assumptions. First, we welcome the application of these concepts when building community in many educational settings. That said, today we want to focus on how architecture and design faculty can engage the increasing number of students who are self-selecting a distance education course or program. With over 6.3 million students in higher education taking at least one online course, distance enrollments have increased for 14 consecutive years. Second, we recognize that most design educators have not personally experienced or observed online learning with the depth and richness that we have experienced and observed traditional on-site learning, starting from our early childhood onward. In this sense, studio-based online learning faculty need to be more open and creative than ever. Online faculty are not able to teach the same way we were taught, even by our most inspiring and influential teachers. However, we are charting new territory, and as with any design process, it is exciting and a bit terrifying. With few prior models and benchmarks to orient faculty, in order for studio-based online learning to become an authentic and engaging virtual space, Institutions need to commit significant resources to online faculty development and instructional design. Lastly, we know that students in higher education are increasingly less traditional. In some cases, non-traditional students are growing at a rate twice as fast as traditional students matriculating directly from high school. Studio-based online learning offers the promise to convene an expanded community of the changed a community open to non-traditional students who are actively engaged in the self-directed design of their own lives. For today's webinar, we have invited four speakers to share their insights on how to start designing and guiding authentic student engagement through studio-based online learning. They will introduce how the virtual studio has a decentralized learning space that can build community through reflection, self-directed discovery, and play. Our first speakers are Amy Larimer, Assistant Director of Architecture and Resident Fellow at Stanford University, and Dr. Drew Krastik, a Psychologist, Educational Consultant, Teacher, and Resident Fellow at Stanford University. Amy and Drew will describe their integrative, holistic model for authentic student engagement. They will also note several accessible practices for beginning to build real community in the virtual classroom. Our second speaker, Yoon Ji Ko, is faculty and director at an intermediate architecture studios at the Boston Architectural College. Yoon Ji will share perspectives on how her flexible online studios connect students from all around the world. She'll speak to how students in her virtual studios are often already building communities and careers and how these students are motivated to engage with others in a non-hierarchical design setting that values openness and respect through self-directed learning. 
Our final speaker, Dr. Garrick Hamm, is an assistant professor of graphic design at North Carolina State University. Derek will use concepts of play to compare approaches to teaching design studio on site and online. He will introduce how virtual studios can use technology and gaming to implement deeper levels of experiential learning, peer to peer collaboration, and design leadership from the bottom up. Now, I am pleased to share our panelists' presentations with you all. Hi, I'm Amy Larimer. I'm the Assistant Director of Stanford Architecture and a resident fellow on campus. Hello, my name is Drew Krafsik. I'm a psychologist, a lecturer, educational consultant, and resident fellow at Stanford. Thanks so much for having us. And before we get started, we just wanted to extend our love and warmth and care to you each and your families in this really unusual and difficult time. Our expertise lies in integrative, holistic, authentic, engaged education. And we believe our model and premises and practices are relevant and transferable. Really what we're trying to do is a harm reduction and a distressing of the classroom and student experiencing a de-stressing, as well as promoting wellness, agency, belonging, and real community in the classroom. Four years ago, we were looking both inside the architecture program and across campus, and just seeing both with our own eyes, but also in the research and student experience, students are disconnected from deeper meaning and purpose, they're stressed, their lives are overscheduled and imbalanced, there's anxiety and depression spikes, they're in checkbox mode, they're afraid of failing, their creativity drops, and often their personal lives are excluded from academic lives, except in choiceful moments. And there's an addiction to screens and technology. And we'd imagine that in your worlds, you're seeing some of that too. So we sat with the questions, what does it mean to prepare students to live a meaningful life? Can our classrooms promote agency, belonging, and well-being? And as administrators, as teachers, what's our role and responsibility? Our response to this for the last four years has been the LIFE model at Stanford, which is a student-centered, holistic model of teaching, learning, and practice. And we call it the LIFE model for three main reasons. One, to honor this idea of continuous and lifelong learning. Two was what learning actually matters to these students' lives. And three, what layers or aspects of students' lives belong in the classroom. We believe their inner life belongs, their relational life, their communal life, or academic and professional life in the life of others. And when we get out to the life of others, there's a lot to learn. There's a lot that teaches us about what academics need to be taught, the professionals we want to become, the health of our communities and how to advocate for equity and inclusion, how to make our relationships more intimate and healthier, and how to know ourselves more in our own inner life. And that connection between inner life and the life of others we found helps students understand in the classroom how to live a more meaningful life. We looked at the traditional educational focus, but centered is academics, which happens in the classroom, in programs, in majors, while simultaneously community. Students are looking to belong in communities, which happen in dorms, teams, organizations. And there's a lot to be said too, in words around wellness. Wellness, though, is siloed to classes, centers and clinics. What we've seen with academics, community and wellness is that they are disproportionate, they're disintegrated, disconnected, and experientially and spatially, they're siloed. As a psychologist, what really was hurtful and bothersome to me in seeing this is that footprint, footprint or blueprint translates to the internalized understanding of profession relative to community and wellness in their lives. So students then turn into professionals who spend a disproportionate amount of time in the studio, in the office, at the sacrifice of friends and family in their communities. And wellness is just reduced to some personal practice. So we were wondering, what would it be like if these spheres of academics, community and wellness were dynamic, equitable, and integrated? And so we brought them together. And we were thinking about the classroom 
how could these be interdependent and intersecting? When we thought of the classroom, we thought of a foreground and background relationship between academics, community, and wellness. At a base level, they all belong, but in any moment, you could center one over the other. Or in any moment when you're thinking about things, you're including all three. What we hoped was this would translate into student leaders that have digested and integrated profession, community, and wellness as interrelated and interconnected. So the life model is the taking of academics, adding community and wellness, and looking at three levels, content, process, and reflection. Academic content, syllabi, learning outcomes, assignments. Academic process is the pedagogy, or what's happening in the actual classroom, whether we articulate it or not. Academic reflection is the thing that students wish they had more, the so what of the learning of this class, why does it matter? We added community content, what could be taught and learned to make this community healthier, more engaging, more real? How do we practice that together in this class as a community? And what's the potential for this community to mean something to my life? We added wellness content, what could we teach and what could be learned to help students be healthier? How do we practice that together in this class? And how does wellness become something that's more important to each of these students? This infrastructure allowed for the natural place of students' inner lives to be part of the class, their relational lives to matter, their communal life to be brought in, their academic and professional life to be tailored both to them and to the world's needs, and the life of others to be considered. This we piloted in architecture, but also with the hope of the translation to professional life. We feel like it's time for a foundational shift to really positively affect student mental health well-being and belonging, while simultaneously deepening academic learning, which is what we found that the life model helps to do. In the student experience, we have lots of examples of them discovering deeper meaning and purpose, practicing balance, reducing some of their stress and anxiety, an increased sense of connection and belonging, moving away from checking boxes, leveraging community when they're hurting. They're open to taking risks when failure is encouraged. They're bolstering their creativity, they're being non-judgmental, they're really experimenting, and their life, their personal life, is being integrated into academic learning. Life model has the potential to be incredibly complex and sophisticated and dimensional. For example, this is a matrix I created for a studio a couple years ago. It also has the potential to be incredibly accessible. So today we have a few invitations and practices, some very low barrier uh, ways of entering life model into your studio that we'd love to share with you today. The first is the invitation to send a welcome message to the students in your course before it begins. What this does is set a tone of warmth and shows that you care before class even kicks off. There's a sense that students can feel welcomed and invited. The message should be authentic and sincere and in your voice. It should humbly introduce you if you've never met these students before, welcome them to a new quarter or semester together. It should have no expectation or cause any stress or anxiety before the class starts, merely just a way to welcome them to the experience and honor maybe the unusual time that we're in together. Another practice that we find is incredibly useful and actually essential to the whole of the entire course is to take time in the first class to co-create class norms and values centered around academics, community, and wellness. What this does is afford consent and respect and agency in the classroom. It, it lets students be the voice leading the trajectory of the class, while as instructors, we have frameworks and ideas and learning outcomes that we have set. There's a way that students get to bring their own voice, their own wishes, their own norms, and that we get to be responsive to. Many students will feel like they don't know what to say at first because perhaps they've never had this opportunity or they don't know what to say. But after you give them a little space, it's incredible how they open up and start to imagine what a really complex and communal and uh, healthy classroom could look and feel like. And we see that impact throughout the whole of the quarter. It's essential as the instructor then to reinforce these values, to check in on them, to make sure that they are 
what's still needed in the class. And that's a great place for mid-quarter, mid-semester feedback. Um, but it's a place where you get to then make subtle shifts in the creation of your curriculum to respond to their needs and wants. Start class with a check-in or a meditation or a walk or a stretch, a way of getting students together, getting them in their bodies, bringing them to the classroom, whether that's in person or online, and increasing presence. There's a way that we have used these techniques repeatedly and they always help create a sense of community. They build trust and check-ins especially are a really lovely way to start class. And we would encourage that you actually don't talk about or expect anything in relationship to the class content. So nothing about architecture, just like, how are you doing? How are you feeling? What's going on in your lives? And then giving plenty of room for them to share as a community. And it might start out a little awkward or quiet, but as you build and as you continue to open space for this, it's amazing how it reinforces community and a sense of connection. Ask each student what matters to them and share what really matters to you about this class. Why are you all here together? And, it, and be totally open to them saying, I have to take this class. There's a way that when you honor the, what's real in the classroom, it really transforms what can happen. Invite them to be themselves, not just a performative version of who they think they need to be in order to succeed in your classroom. This can be also incredibly transformative. Be okay with them not being okay. Allow them to show up tired or stressed and honor that. It's an invitation to be real and it gives total permission to show up as they are. It increases the sense of purpose and connection in the classroom as well and it has been a really powerful aspect. Lastly, bring so much compassion. These are unusual times and really difficult times. One way we do this is to offer flexible deadlines to students. It centers their wellness, encourages balance and advocacy and agency, and helps them feel not so pressured and overwhelmed. It also helps them build their own intrinsic sense of balance and knowing when to give effort and time to different things and when to ask for a little help. There's something that can be incredibly powerful about this and again, cultivates wellness and community and trust. Overall, these are, these are very basic and high level practices that we have found have had tremendous value and impact in the classroom. We hope they can be useful for you in your classrooms too. And we really look forward to any questions that you have. Hi, I am Yunji Ko at the Boston Architectural College and I'd like to talk about the potentials of learning architecture online. Now, you may be wondering, why learn online? Does it actually work? Also, what are the benefits and challenges of taking an architecture studio online? All of these are valid questions, as we are more used to learning formats on site with an in-person interaction. It is natural to wonder about how learning may be different online. When classes are held in a virtual setting, there is more flexibility in both time and in space. Classes can be held in a format of synchronous meetings and or asynchronous meetings. Synchronous meetings provide an opportunity for students and faculty to check in face to face and talk in real time. These are suitable for discussions and seminar type classes, as well as studio desk pinups pin ups and reviews where you need direct feedback from one another. Here in this slide, you see an online desk grid taking place, sketching over drawings the student has produced with verbal feedback over the screen. In comparison, asynchronous meetings provide an opportunity to continue learning beyond an allocated face-to-face -face meeting time. For example, asynchronous meetings may be used to post assignments or to review recorded video lectures or written feedback. This type of learning allows for more flexibility as it does not rely on real-time learning and allows students to work at their own pace. Here in this slide, as you can see in the blue box on the right, students have commented on each other's work. These written feedback are posted at times that fit their schedule. As students review and comment on each other's work, 
This type of asynchronous learning allows to recreate an online studio culture. By reviewing each other's work, students get to know each other through their work and also are able to check their own performance in comparison to one another's. There's a sense of self-discovery that takes place when learning online. Students need to motivate themselves, often with less social guidance or peer pressure that can be more present in a physical on-site setting. Students who otherwise would have limited access to certain educational facilities and resources are able to join online and partake in getting education. Online studios are joined by young parents. You'll see later in this presentation, one of our students, Kelly, who stayed on the online master's program throughout the process of giving birth to a child. She gave birth in May and stayed on to return back to us in the fall semester. Online education also allows educational access for internationals without the appropriate visa, as well as people in parts of the world without an accredited architecture program in the vicinity, or those with full-time jobs who simply need and want flexibility in their study. Another student lives and works in China, where he is part of a mega city planning project. It is important for him and his firm to carry through this project, so at the same time, he is able to advance his academic career online. The ability to stay at their own environment, not only access, but also complete paths towards getting an accredited architecture degree is a major reason that these students have decided to learn online. Architecture as a field of study values an integrative way of understanding our surroundings. Assessing, conceptualizing, and designing through drawings, making, and modeling, there are a variety of tools and methods that we as architects work. Online classes leverage on this idea and use a wealth of tools, softwares, platforms online to aid learning. From modeling software to a diverse array of information available online, online teaching uses a diversity of resources. Also, the ease of access to those diverse resources is another benefit. For example, in a design review on site, when a faculty mentions a design precedent, the student may jot it down in a notebook and afterwards may or may not look up the precedent. In an online design review, it is simply easier to pull things directly from the internet to the screen at the click of a button ready to be shared as the review is happening without much delay. Also, online teaching opens up diversity in the classroom demographic. As you can join an online class from any part of the world that has internet, students and faculty living in different parts of the globe can bring diverse contexts. The School of Architecture at the Boston Architectural College has 242 master's students in the spring of 2020 of which 86 students are online. This marks 36% of our master's degree student population. 67% of our online students are internationals from countries ranging from Canada, China, Vietnam, and Abu Dhabi. 27% of our online students are of color. Diverse contexts bring diverse perspectives. For example, here is one of our online students, Tom, who is based in Beijing, China. As part of his third architecture studio project, he is using precedents that he is familiar with across the globe. We see flood mitigation projects from Stockholm to lesser known projects in the Western Hemisphere in Vietnam and Cambodia. His ability to relate to design ideas evidence in these geographical span enables him to design a project that uses the best of both worlds. Here's another example where a student based in Toronto is learning from comparing the site contexts of her studio project site based in Maverick Hills in Boston to the one in her home city, Toronto. As a number of students join from different parts of the world, they are able to relate and pull in ideas from their home city and places of familiarity and also share those perspectives with each other. Here's a thesis student, Genevia from Alaska, who applied her lessons back home to reflect on the Alaskan oil development industry and its relationship to indigenous species. 
Her study on the petroleum reserve and Arctic National Wildlife Refuge resulted in a design of relief shelters specific to Alaska. As she developed her thesis, she was able to apply lessons and precedents learned from a number of diverse online faculty and share it with her colleagues in Alaska. So having students of different backgrounds in the same classroom helps create a holistic view on the built environment as well as reflect back on the current physical environment and discover elements that can be applied to other parts of the world. As such, being online relies on openness. Openness to be flexible thinkers, not afraid to test out and adopt different tools, ready to engage with a wider community. It is also important to be open to adaptation. There will always be another newer software that comes out and tests out new capabilities or get established as the industry norm. So being open to adapt to new technologies and situations is essential. When it comes to online studio teaching, there are many technological tools, but not one that does all the magic. So it is important to take existing platforms and to adapt to fit each class needs. Also, having an open mindset includes embracing failure. From technical glitches to kids walking in during meetings, things can go wrong. Your first online class will not always go perfectly as planned. But perhaps these things that go wrong will open up new opportunities. So it is important to be open to failure and build in chances for students to fail. Encourage your students to try one more time even in an online environment. Here is an interview of one of our online students, Kelly, on her journey in online learning. In this video, you will see stills of on-site teaching formats that are adapted to a fully online environment. My name is Kelly. I come from Chicago, and I am in the online Master's of Architecture program. I did my undergraduate degree almost 15 years ago now and I've been in the professional field of architecture for about 10 years and I was always told that it would be really hard to go back to school. What drew me was that I could do this and continue my normal life. I've gotten further along in my career and I've moved up in a sense but that still doesn't mean that I get to design as much as I would like to. I don't think really anyone does. There's so much logistical work and administrative work and busy work, this has really allowed me to get back into that creative mindset, just letting the ideas flow without budget, without real world clients, without, you know, the everyday constraints. It's nice to see that we are all from completely different backgrounds. No one person has the same job. No one person lives in the same place. And we've all come together to do the same thing. It's nice to see those differences. I recently had a daughter. I had a baby in May. I'm excited to show my daughter that I was able to do all of this while she entered into her lives. <laughs> it's been comforting to know that this is a flexible program, that they work with you and understand that you are an adult with a life, and the faculty and the staff will help you make this happen. They don't want to see you fail. It's largely made me very happy. It's the people that I've met. It's the work I've been able to produce. Uh, it's knowing what I'll get in the end. As we start this conversation centered on studio-based online learning, we need to have a moment of honesty and our acknowledgement that the current practices found in design education, found in studio-based education, is not altogether utopian. You know, in fact, when we talk to students outside of the, the scope of power influences like faculty members or, or administrators, when we talk to students one-on-one, -on -one, I often find a different story about the studio environment than what's professed by design faculty even myself. Uh, building communities and engaging design is hard enough fat feat in itself. But now as we look to create these communities virtually or through distance, we might find an opportunity to make some amends to several of the missteps that we currently find in the studio. 
So let's speculate here. Let's look at the future of design education outside of our traditional face-to-face -face model and see where we might find opportunities to actually make things better. So what are the real issues? What are we actually giving up when we start transitioning away to a distance-based model versus the face-to-face? -face? And we have to look at the core of how studios operate. And the first thing that comes to my mind is the constructionist or constructivist model of a studio environment. You know, design is learned experientially. It's from the actionable process of designing. That's how we design. We don't read about design. Students actually design. But it's also through the interaction with artifacts that are a part of this experiential learning. And when we think about moving away from that physical base, yes, we're giving some things up. We're talking about losing the property of wrestling with physical materials, which is very important to the learning process. It's very important to the experiential process. But I would ask us to pause and question, well, when we talk about about losing interaction with physical materials are the physical materials materials of final design that is building materials or the raw materials of the of the actual thing or are we talking about losing interaction with the physical materials of representation and that's where we have to kind of shed that old skin and say, you know, maybe everything isn't wrestled up on a physical model. Everything isn't the end game of touching that cardboard, that chipboard. Maybe we can begin to migrate away from these to other forms of representation that still offer the experiential process. We'll look at that a little bit later. You know, the second notion of something that could be disrupted as we move away is this notion of top-down um, structure of learning. Design is taught top-down. You know, that's from the studio head all the way down to the TA and then trickling down to students. But I would argue it can also be taught bottom up. And when we start thinking about what it means for a studio environment to, to shift in this notion, I like to quote uh, DeCoven here, who talks about the difference between game communities and play communities. And in the game communities, the roles and the officials, you know, that's us, that's the faculty members, they constantly control the active players. They decide the suitable conditions for play to occur. I would like to suggest that we can shift and using this opportunity to shift to play communities in which the players themselves are in control of the structure and they constantly manipulate the boundaries to ensure that they are having fun. Now, with this kind of shift, obviously there has to be a structural change to enable that play community to thrive, to develop, and then the educator becomes more of a curator of play and less of a ruling official. And then finally, we think about design, this notion of the individual. Is it about the individual? Is it about the collective? You know, back and forth. And oftentimes, we say we're about group learning. We say we're about collaboration. But if we look deeply, what we're actually doing is called coexistence. And that's referencing the work of Hackman, who talked about this notion of co-acting groups. You know, when there's a lack of codependence, when there's a lack of collective responsibility, when there's a lack of clear sense of direction and meaningful tasks, studio members might say they're collaboratively working in an environment, but what we actually find is coexistence. So I would like us to take a look at when we talk about distance learning in this virtual learning environment, rather whether that be a spatial virtual environment or a two-dimensional virtual environment, looking at a screen base, that we are still these opportunities for us to migrate and move away uh, from these current models that we have to something that seems to be a little bit closer to what we profess the studio actually is. So how do we move there? Where do we go from here? Uh, the first thing I would like us to, to think about is potentially leveraging, the, leveraging this new technology in itself as a way for deeper level of experiential learning. And, and I know, you know, virtual reality, when I first tried it, I was so excited and I thought this could be such a game changer because for the first time we could now experience design on a one-to-one -one scale. And that's something that's rich and it's something that we've seen with the evolution of even uh, game, gaming software that renders in real time rendering, giving us this first hand perspective, whether you're at a screen base or you're putting a, a virtual headset on. But if we track the evolution of this technology, where it's heading, I would argue that there's going to be this bright future when we can not just look at it on a screen, but collectively gather there. That's having a body presence, being in the space so we can talk with each other. You know, the true virtual tour or the true kind of my kids would say that the magic school bus effect where you can actually go there together and we can talk and we can interact. Now, in some of these early software systems that allow this to happen for people to gather in a virtual space, yes, it is true. We lose some fidelity as you see here in Altspace VR. 
but it's only a matter of time between before this fidelity increases and merges closer to what we saw with the Unreal Game Engine before, and people can be coexistence in spaces that are created by students in real time. And it's not much of a delay between the student's thought process and design to where we can actually just throw a headset on and be collaboratively in that space to critique it, to look at it, and then have general discussion. So speaking of critique, you know, there's this notion that we could potentially use these this opportunity of remoteness to decentralize the voice of the design critic. If you think about how we critique students' works from the desk crit to the final crit to the end of the semester, it's very much still picked and driven by the faculty members. We decide who evaluates the work. We decide who looks at it. And I think there's a unique opportunity to encourage students to get a broader voice of a critique of who might look at it. Now, on the surface, yes, we have video conferencing. We can bring people in to look at it from all over the world. But my suggestion is to push the envelope a little bit further. Um, pretty soon, that screen-based Zoom that we have might end up being merged with the, the first example I showed you of the, the virtual environments. And in the case of the virtual avatar being able to be in a space where we can interact with another human being from across the world, whether it be a member of the public, a member of a community, or just um, a, a, a peer at another institution, to once again be in a collaborative space and so that giving the agency to the students to reach out on their own and have conversations about their work with other people in the mixture beyond saying wait a second for you to move to from point a to point b talk to me first or let's have this traditional structure of where you get a review and this is has a lot to do with moving towards this idea of co construction of design becoming a collaborative learning environment in the studio and not just a coexistence getting students to co construct ideas co construct designs together is very, very difficult. Uh, but when we start thinking of the platforms that enable this to happen across anything, not just the design, it's like writing a paper, or doing anything, we have really great tools that we need to start thinking about migrating our studios and promoting them to use just as what we see happening in the work environment. And I like to think of these things as the hard tools versus soft tools. So on the left, we think of these hard tools, things that we would find in a traditional work environment. Obviously, in the profession of architecture, we have building information modeling, tools like Revit that bring multiple stakeholders together. We have Google Suites to allow us to work on multiple documents together and interact with this. But I would say on the softer side of things, we have things like Slack. We have things like Facebook groups. You know, in my uh, studio, or, or rather my research lab, I use Slack. And what I love about this notion of soft tools is that it invites another form of communication with the, 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 the peers. It also invites another form of communication with even um, faculties and directors with students. And what I like to say is, for instance, I get my memes from students in Slack and response from things, and I don't get that on the, the platforms on the left. So we really need to think about how we use hard and soft tools dipping into social media platforms and saying, well, if our students are already here and they're using these spaces, why not use them for ourselves? Why not use them for an environment for learning? And just as a student here in TikTok, using this uh, playfully, asking people to do like your project, I say, yes, this is the future. Let's start using these unconventional tools, whether they're virtual, whether they're screen-based and mobile, and bring us into this new era to collaborate, to interact, and basically to learn through play. Okay, everybody. Um, so I wanted to open it up for questions. We've been receiving a lot of really great questions. Um, which I'm really excited about and we're going to go through. Please continue to enter your questions as we're talking in the chat. Um, and one thing I just wanted to do for those of uh, you that joined a little bit late is I just wanted to kind of remind you of some of the key assumptions that we have with this webinar. And the first is that the audience that we are really focusing on here are students who are self-selecting into online learning. And so we wanted to, um, address this as a type of pedagogical model that is intentional and that students self-select into. And the, the second is that um, 
we know that we don't have any experience with this. Uh, we certainly have from our childhood onward a rich experience with on-site learning and um, that means that our institutions really do need to invest in this type of learning. So there are a couple questions about um, sort of resource poor institutions and today. And we recognize that in order for this to succeed and to build community in a meaningful way in this format, um, institutions need to in, in this type of learning. And then lastly, is just self-direction and, um, and sort of the autonomy that that affords. So I would like to start um, with a, a question that um, was a, about the life model. And um, that question is, um, a, pretty straightforward and it's just about, it says, hi, curious about whether your studios are semester based about 14 weeks or quarters, 10 weeks, and um, how does this impact the integration of your life model? So this question will be for Drew and Amy. Hi, this is Amy. Um, I can share that I've used life model in studios. We are on a quarter system at Stanford. And so 10-week um, long studios. I've also used it in summer programs that are three weeks and six weeks long. So have had a variety of different uh, time lengths to experiment with it. And I haven't found that the time impacts the expression of it. I guess a, a, a question back, if there's any uh, more depth to that that you're interested in, I would be eager to understand or know to respond to. Um, we've applied it in all sorts of classroom settings too, from studios to seminars, and found it to be super effective across time and expression too. Okay. The next question is from Magda, and uh, she asks, what are your thoughts on the online critique central to architectural education as we know it? How can it work online? And um, does it matter that there is an unavoidable loss of performance when we move uh, the critique online. So I'm going to um, ask Yunji to, to respond to that. Hi, um, thanks for the question, Magda. Um, so your question was on, you know, how can, how effective can desk critics and apps reviews happen online? And um, for, for the, for my studio that I've been teaching at the Boston Architecture College, we've actually been able to replicate the experience on site completely online. We use a combination of tools like Zoom and Google Drive so that students can not only share the work that they have been working on throughout the semester, but there's also um, ability for them to share it with the guest critics before and after the studio review, also to record it. So I would say there's a little bit more flexibility in terms of um, presentation format and how it is stored and recorded. Um, there's also a combination of other tools, especially on Zoom and other um, platforms that offers guest critics to uh, physically, like online sketch on top of the student's work, uh, which comes in really handy when you're trying to redline a student's work. And there's also tools where you can uh, remotely control the, um, the presenter's mouse. So there are a number of different tools that are available um, that can be tested out online. So um, in, in terms of replicating that sort of studio desk script pinup review environment online, it has actually been pretty seamless, in my opinion, of how that happens. Also, when a desk crit or a review happens online, instead of um, people, instead of the guest critics sitting in one row in the front, typically, and the students are sort of, you know, on their phone and um, on the back side of the room, that dynamic really shifts online because everyone is on the same screen. Everyone has access to the same microphone. So there is a little bit more of a democracy that takes place. So the dynamic is certainly changes, but I would say it's been working out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There are a number of questions that address the feel and atmosphere of the class, uh, adapting teaching when the only interaction that you have with students is through a screen um, and building community rapport and trust 
in that format. So I think that this question, you know, I open this question to any of our panelists. Derek, how about you start? Well, I think one of the things um, we have to understand is that there's a difference between our undergrad populations and our graduate populations. Um, I will say most of my online coursework that I teach has to do with graduate populations. I have two doctor of design students who I interact with every week and it's a remote system. Obviously they're a little bit older. Um, I've used a actual meetup application for a virtual reality and Oculus Rift with a PhD student out of intention just to see if this is the future of interaction. What would it be if we intentionally decided to meet in a headset for once a week for a semester? I've done that. And then with my undergraduate populations, this is the first time because of coronavirus where I'm having to meet with them in Zoom. And one of the things that I find, and I'm reflecting to the first presentations, is that treating them as human beings, having those moments of reflections where you're just checking in and you're not talking about the actual coursework, checking in with them as human beings. That was a protocol I was doing face to face. And I find it even more necessary now while my students are dispersed um, all over the state and all over the nation. So I would say that rapport has to do with you showing leadership and saying, I'm concerned about you as an individual. I'm concerned with you about your life outside of studio. And I'm supportive of you just thriving as a human being. I think that approach works on every platform, whether it's face-to-face -face or digitally online. Yeah, I would add to that um, because I think a lot of these questions that we're having about teaching online, in fact, apply to teaching on site as well. Um, it's easy to assume that by just being on site, there's a sense of social community, when in fact, just being physically in the same room doesn't guarantee a classroom dynamic that is collaborative and understanding of all the members of the class. And students who are close friends with each other prior to the start of the course will stay easily together compared to a student who is entering the class without knowing anyone. So the question here is really a dis not a question about the distinction between on-site and online, but really a question of how do we as educators encourage that sense of community, you know, inner sort of reflection and well-being. And um, to be open to listen to one another, you know, learn from it, one another and create a natural network together. And I, I don't think there's a easy answer to this question, but it, it really is um, a combination of things. It starts with the instructor and ex exemplifying that sort of openness, listen and learn from the students, you know, check in with each other. Um, all these things kind of create a sense of community and willingness to learn online and on the site. I would add to that too. I really completely agree with everything that's been said. I think there's the great value as instructors of encouraging those type of truly human interactions, whether that's instructor with one-on-one -on, -one on student or in a larger group check-in, but then also the possibility of inviting students and not just inviting, but encouraging experiences that allow them to get to know each other personally too. And to what Derek was saying, not just about the project they're working on, but them and their lives, encouraging them to get to know one another and build personal relationships only fortifies that sense of community um, collectively as well. There are a number of questions about synchronous versus asynchronous meeting. Um, and I think there have already been some comments about that in the, the chat, but I just wanted to um, give any of you a, a moment to comment on, on what you think works and what your approach is with those two approaches. Yeah, um, I can start. So I think it's really um, a combination of asynchronous and synchronous that works well. It's actually, I would say it's essential to combine the two. If you imagine teaching on site, there are times when classes happen and students are in the classroom, but there's also times when students are working on their own assignments, not in the classroom. So if you think about how um, the experience of learning takes place on site, um, I would rec you know, replicate that online and say, in a synchronous meeting, uh, 
people are on a Zoom meeting platform or they are sort of, you know, engaging with each other face to face, which is important, it's absolutely necessary because you want to catch those ideas and questions in real time. At the same time, it's also essential for students to be checking in um, at their own flexibility of time and space. So I would say the combination of the two is essential. Can I add to that? Definitely. I, I, I think there is also the value of creating um, synchronous online interaction without you as the instructor in the room. This is a, something hilarious happened to me yesterday with my studio in which I usually, now where they're in this new protocol, we meet, we have discussions on Zoom, I have a big studio of 37 students. And we're interacting, we're doing it, and then I'll give them something or a prompt to think about. And in one case, I, I said, I'm gonna grab a coffee break, and I muted myself on audio and video. For some reason, students just assumed after I grabbed my coffee and was back that I was still so-called out of the room. And it was amazing to see how some of the quiet ones just started getting chatty with each other. And they were just talking and interacting. And then eventually, of course, I unmuted and was like, hey guys, I'm back, I'm ready to go. But I said, hey, you know, I want you all to feel free to stay online. I checked in with one of my students, one of my advisees. It was amazing that they were able to stay online and interact without me in the room. And sometimes we forget that happens naturally in our physical spaces when we leave the studio, when we're out and they're still working late at night or whatever, we want them to keep that same energy up. So when we set up these Zoom meetings and we have these conversations, I think it's really healthy for sometimes for us just to be absent and let them continue to interact without that power structure of a TA of a faculty in the room as, as friendly as we are, as nice as we try to present ourselves, we still have representation of power to especially undergrad population. So I would say, make sure that that's also a space for them to be together without the so-called adult in the room. I totally agree with that. I think there's something incredibly powerful about, it's like an honoring of them, right? That maybe there's a space that's set up, that's a studio space where faculty is not allowed. There's no, the link is not given to faculty and it's just, it's just a purely online student space. And I think there's a way, such a beautiful point that different types of interactions occur and, and different connections are possible there. There are also a number of questions um, about whether or not, uh, so there's a, there's a question, um, regarding the student's voice and um, whether or not, and I guess whether or not the student truly, you know, what we're talking about here is representative. And I think I'd just say, I would respond by saying, um, as I mentioned in the kind of introduction and that online learning is something that uh, enrollment has increased consecutively for 14 straight years. Right now, 6.3 6 million students in higher education in the United States take at least one online class. Uh, and at the same time, for the past four years, traditional enrollments have decreased. And so with questions about um, will students want this online remote format and barriers to it. I think that um, we're seeing that students are seeking this format. So that's going to be a response to those types of questions. Okay. Um, so the uh, another question that I'd like to ask, that I think pulls together several of them is whether this, this issue of autonomy um, and community building. And so on site and online studio um, teach and encourage students to assume responsibility for their own learning. And I'm wondering if you can speak to the dynamic between the autonomy that online studios afford um, while also building community and, and the design process. Sure, um, I guess I can go. Um, in terms of uh, autonomy, I think it's um, pretty self-explanatory that when students are learning online, they have the flexibility um, you know, to engage with courses at their own time and schedule. So in order for someone to do that, 
they need to be self-directed. They need to be motivated to have that sort of um, engagement with the class online. Um, I think a lot of the questions about online teaching has to do with the lack of physical interaction, that without in-person interaction, it's difficult to establish person-to-person -person relationships and also communicate lessons and ideas and develop a studio culture. And I actually think during this crisis, I've seen a lot of footage of people playing their musical instruments on the balcony together, bringing people to the balcony to sing along together. Um, and so whenever I see those footages, I, I realize it's not necessarily the physical distance that hinders relationships to be cultivated. Even at a distance, if there's a will to form relationships and culture, there will be a way. And so when I think about my own studio, my students and I have been using a variety of tools to stay in touch with each other, even when the class is not officially in session. And Derek, you just talked about stepping out of the classroom and seeing, you know, the, the students just engage with each other and talk to, talking to each other um, at an energy level that it's so amazing. So whether it's a combination of Instagram, email, you know, Slack or WhatsApp, there are so many different tools that, you know, that you can use online. Um, and I think it really has to be, has to do with more opening that up to the students and giving room and space for the students to do that in order to cultivate that relationship and studio culture online. There's also a question about um, group work and um, you and Jim just wondering if you can touch upon that. Yeah, so in terms of group work, um, I gave a brief example in my presentation, but I have um, my students upload their process work on Google Slides, which is very effective because they can check in on each other's work throughout the class when, whenever they want to really, and leave comments on, on another. So um, they're able to create like a group sense of who's doing what kind of design project and learn from each other's um, projects in that way. And then another quick question about whether or not you find the progression or completion rates of online students, online studios to be similar to traditional models. Yeah, I would say so far um, at the Boston Architectural College, we have the exact same learning lessons and requirements for students online and on site. Both programs are accredited and we don't really um, distinguish a program difference between on-site and online students. And we see that both regardless of whether on-site and online, we see that students um, graduate at a very similar rate. Um, it may take a little bit more time for online students because usually the students who are joining online are those students who need that kind of flexibility, whether they're young parents or they have something going on in their lives um, that require more flexibility. But in terms of completion rates, it's quite similar. Okay, thank you for that. Um, there are a number of other questions and I'm very excited about the um, incredible conversation that we have. And I think this is what, is, what this is telling us is that we uh, need to offer more of these conversations and pick up on where all of you are, um, are wanting us to dig in deeper. But before that, I wanted to just end with a, a bigger question, which is on um, how I, I'm seeing in each of your presentations and in each of your work, how you are really uh, introducing this idea of the focus of the online studio, shifting instruction from the atelier master teacher to the student and student-centered student learning. And so I'm wondering how this, this design process that is intentionally and explicitly learner-centered can serve architecture education and practice more broadly. And Amy and Drew, how about you start it off? I think there's a possibility here to get really creative about the ways that we engage. I appreciate a lot of these questions coming up around um, how, we, how we talk about power in the classroom, how we respond to students and student voices and center student voices. Um, I think whether this 
you know, I would imagine a lot of folks joining today um, might have some anxiety about moving to online platforms um, because of the swift shift and maybe many folks who haven't had the chance to teach in this manner before. There's a lot of emotions that it brings up and I think it does the same for our students as well. Um, in a broader context, I think there's a possibility, I mentioned this before, but to bring a little more compassion to our studies together and our experiences together and to humanize the experience of the, the studio, um, bringing some humility to our conversations and ways of relating, knowing that we're working with new technology, a lot of us working with new technologies and methods of trying to communicate and engage in ways that we've known have been really effective, but now might not translate in the same way. So I think there's this possibility for in this, in this shift, it, whether it's briefly or more expansive to online learning, to practice being human with each other, growing our communities and um, being experimental in that way in ways that can hopefully translate then to the in-person dialogue when that happens again. Derek, how about? Yeah, with one of the things that I did not put on my presentation that because I'm discovering some of these things in real time, um, the power of a studio that allows students to be anonymous um, at certain times. I'm talking about um, an exercise I did just yesterday in which during, um, before my studio, in the middle and after, I was able to do a poll and set it up with Zoom for it to be a live poll so I can get real time. Are you getting it? Are you not getting it? Um, is this working? And it was amazing that I was able to set that up anonymously and get feedback that I could never get in the studio. In the studio, it's all about looking at their faces, getting head nods, seeing, you know, is a light bulb on, puzzled faces or not. And we don't have that infrastructure. And I'm, actually, we do have the infrastructure in the studio to do things like polls. But the online system enabled me to like get real time data as an instructor for me to say, OK. And then even with that, um, using the chat to the side, enabling students to ask questions in which they're not outed as I didn't understand that or could you repeat that for me to see a student use that and ask a question directly to me and not kind of as the broad question um, for the whole studio. I've seen just in this one week students who have been quiet being able to have a voice because they felt psychologically safe in a group of 37 students to say, hey, say that over again, or I can't do that. So I think we should look at this as the silver lining and say, what are these itemized things that this is unique to the studio that actually works for us? And I think that has been the spirit of all of our conversations to say, let's dig in and make um, some lemonade out of lemons. Great. Yeah. Yunji, please add your thoughts. Yeah, um, I think this question really brings us to ask about the role of education. And if I think about that, um, if I think about what our architecture studios do, um, I like to say we want to prepare our students for the world, but to be to be ready for the world, but also to become agents and drivers to expand the horizon and the field, whether that's being um, techno technologically ready and teaching them the right skills to be prepared in um, practicing in the world and also design thinking. So if I th start with technical skills, I mean, practice, um, has been using already some of these online meeting softwares and um, there are many online digital tools that are currently being used in practice. And so if we want to prepare our students to be ready for the new world, um, I think it's essential for the students to be able to have tested out those capabilities in the classroom so that they are not only just knowing the software and the platforms, but they are also building in that capacity to adapt to newer platforms and softwares um, and build that comfort level when there's a new software or a platform that they have to get, a, get used to. And I also think in addition to um, embracing those technical skills, we also definitely want to teach them design thinking and also want them to become you know, good citizens of a global community. So 
um, I think in terms of online learning, it really begins to embrace diverse perspectives on diverse contexts. Um, an idea that works in a certain part of the country may be applied differently or not at all in a different part of the globe. So with different kind of contexts that are brought in naturally in an online setting, there's different perspectives that naturally need to emerge as well. So creating that kind of openness to embrace diversity of ideas and allowing the students to broaden their perspective and test out different perspectives in a architectural education is essential. Thank you, Amy, Drew, Derek, and Yunji. We very much appreciate you sharing your insights with us today. And thank you to all of our attendees who have joined. Thank you for all of the amazing questions. And we look forward to hosting another webinar so that we can continue the conversation. Take care, everybody. <laughs>